My daughter wants a snake. She wants a snake for a pet in our house. I told her I unfairly was going to bring the whole church to pray against that happening. <laughs> snakes are supposed to live outside. I have nothing against snakes. I'm happy for them to eat rodents and things outside the house. I realized I probably contributed to her desire for a snake because somewhere along the line a couple of years ago, she was interested in getting a hamster, a gerbil, a rabbit, or a guinea pig. And I said, mmm, no rodents. Please, let's not do rodents. I would take a reptile over a rodent any day. So she found a reptile that she wanted. She's been asking for a snake and she's watching, oh, the cutest videos on YouTube. And now we, I do not want a snake in my house. A lot of people have strong feelings about snakes. Snakes actually play a, a significant role in part of today's story. Snakes are either something to be feared or a, uh, si they were a symbol of power or authority. They were something that people either detested or used um, as a symbol of strength. I don't want one <laughs> in my house <laughs> or in my life in that kind of way. But they do show up in this story today. Uh, perhaps you recall uh, Pharaoh, an image of uh, the Egyptian pharaohs with their headdresses on, or the images on the sarcophaguses, the giant cobra that, that is like flailed up um, on the top of their headdress. It was a sign of divine authority. It was a sign of their ability and, and their rightness in ruling. And uh, the snakes, show up in the story of Moses going before Pharaoh. We heard a little bit about it last week, heard a, a bit about Moses' call and how Moses encounters God in the burning bush and that he's supposed to go to Pharaoh to ask to let the people go because the Hebrew people have been enslaved in Egypt and they are living under the, the tyranny of Pharaoh who is making them build bricks or make bricks and build buildings and cities, um, just labor that is terrible and exploited and happens all day long and backbreaking kind of work. The people want to leave and they don't want to be there and they don't want to be um, treated this way anymore and they've been crying out for God to help them and Moses is going to be the messenger that God sends to Pharaoh to let the people go. You know the song, right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, let my people go. Yep, that one. Moses is going to go ask, and he's going to say it actually a whole bunch of times because it doesn't happen the first time that he goes before Pharaoh to ask for the people to be let go. Uh, there's uh, some parts in the book of Exodus that often kind of, you know, we hear about the burning bush and then we jump ahead to the plagues and then maybe to the crossing of the Red Sea, but there's a little bit of narrative that happens in the chapters between some of those places, and that's where we're going today often skipped over because it doesn't seem like it's a huge, um, exciting part of the action, but there are some real insights into the character of Moses and the character of Pharaoh and ultimately the character of God that show up in these passages. I'm going to back up from chapter 7, which I read for us just a few moments ago, to chapter 5. Uh, God had sent Moses and, and ultimately Aaron with him to go to the people and say, um, hey, we're going to ask for your freedom and I'm going to go to Pharaoh. And they missed a detail. They were supposed to take all of the elders with them to Pharaoh. But they either got excited or ready just to get it done. And Moses and Aaron go straight away just by themselves to Pharaoh to ask that the people would be let go. This is their in. These are their words. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. I don't know if the narrative just cuts it way short, but there's not a lot of pomp and circumstance. They didn't bend their knees. They didn't go, oh, Pharaoh, we are so glad to have an audience before you. We're so grateful for you to listen to us today. We have a message for you. I mean, it's like they just marched on in. And, and if you are a person in authority, and you are used to people deferring to you, and you have somebody march on in boldly and just tell you what to do, the response is usually not great, right? Our natural response is, who do you think you are? That's Pharaoh's response too. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I'm not letting Israel go. I don't know whose authority you're coming in here to ask upon this God that you name, but it's not my God. I don't know him. 
that I don't have anything, I don't have to do anything that he asks me to do. In fact, Pharaoh probably thought that he himself was a god that there were lots of gods, and once you become Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, you not only have divine authority, but at some point you're kind of divinity in and of yourself. And and so Pharaoh's like, I don't know this god, and I don't really care. No thank you. Uh, Then the Moses and, and Aaron try something a little bit different. They realize, oh yes, how can we play to Pharaoh's self interest here? Because Pharaoh's self-interest is that the cities of Egypt continue to be built on the backs of the Hebrew people. Uh, Pharaoh wants the labor to continue, and so they say, um, the God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go three days' journey into the wilderness to sacrifice and worship. Let us go worship the Lord our God, or he will fall upon us with pestilence or sword. What they're saying here is, um, okay, Pharaoh, you probably should let us go because even if you don't know this God, we know this God, this is our God, and if we don't go worship our God like he asked us to do, well, then we could all get sick and die. Like his curses might rain down on us, and then where are you left? Where's your labor force then? So uh, they're kind of asking, you know, okay, we can't just be let go under the authority of uh, Yahweh's name, but maybe we can make a convincing argument. At least maybe Pharaoh would let us go for a couple of days to go worship. Well, Pharaoh is not interested in that either. Either Pharaoh is not scared or does not care about the possibility of their God punishing them in some way, shape, or form. But Pharaoh actually, <laughs> he just... He says, why are you trying to take these people away from their work? There are a lot of them. They're more num- numerous than even the Egyptians are. So, you know, part of what's going on there, Pharaoh is like, I-, I have to keep them working because otherwise they could rise up in power. If they were to lead a rebellion, they probably could overthrow us. So, uh, no, you are not getting what you have asked for. And in fact, uh, no longer, or not only am I going to not let them go, but that same day, Pharaoh gets together the taskmasters, those who oversee all of the work, and he gets them together and the supervisors, and he says, hey, listen, these people are getting ideas about going, and we need to go ahead and squash that right now, so let's make their work harder. It's not enough that they're working from sunup to sundown and doing all sorts of physical labor that is, that is, that is hurting them. Um, we now are going to make them make bricks without straw. You see, what was happening is as they were making bricks out of mud and straw, you use the straw as a composite to, to set kind of the mud concrete, if you will. And they would build these bricks, they would lay them out in the sun, and then the bricks would be used to build buildings. And different people had different jobs in this, but they had cut straw to work with. And God, it, or, and Pharaoh here is saying, um, these people are, are they have a, f- a little bit too much time to think. So we're going to make their labor harder. Now we're going to make them go get the straw themselves, cut it from the fields, haul it on in, in here. And their quota for bricks is going to be exactly the same. No lightening up on the workload there. So more work in the same amount of time. And um, not only that, but the... Uh, the taskmasters are going to be told to oversee it. The taskmasters are Egyptians, but then there's supervisors who are Hebrew people. You know, like the middle managers that they brought in to, that are kind of from among the people. So if the Hebrew people are in leadership telling the Hebrew people what to do, maybe they won't be as likely to rebel against them. Well, what happens is, is that, that, you know, they're told this is the new plan. Go get people to work. They get to work. They make bricks, and they don't make as many bricks. And so the middle managers, the supervisors who are the Hebrew people get beaten, get beaten within an inch of their life because the people are not producing as much with this new workload. Well, then everybody cries out, those managers, those supervisors, all the people who were, who were making the bricks, the people who were building the buildings, they're crying out and they're thinking, this is horrible. They go to Moses and to Aaron, and, and they say, like, you have made this worse for us. You told us that God was going to take us to freedom. You told us that there was a good plan for us, and he was going to help us out of slavery, and you just need to keep your mouth shut because it has gotten worse before it got better. Sometimes that happens. And frankly, when it happens, it is really easy for us to doubt God's work in it. When we are in a circumstance that sort of uh, the, the step towards freedom involves unraveling things and things getting worse before they get better, sometimes we look at that and think, well, I'm done. I'm out here. 
Sometimes that happens in a relationship. You know the relationship where there's like some tension and some polite avoidance, but you know something's not okay? If it's going to get better, sometimes it's you got to say some hard things, and you have to hear some hard things. And there have to be some very, very difficult conversations indeed long before reconciliation takes place. The people want out. And in fact, Moses and Aaron are thinking, maybe we should be done with this thing too. But God says, come on. I am still at work here. I have to fulfill my promises. When I have begun a good work, don't you know that I'm going to see it through to completion? In fact, uh, the Lord says to Moses, you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. I'm going to remind you, by a mighty hand, he will let them go. By a mighty hand, he will drive them out. And then God says to him, I am the Lord. Don't you know who I am? You're bowing to Pharaoh. He is less than I am. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob as God the Almighty. He goes on and he says, I have remembered my covenant. Don't you know I am the Lord? I will free you from the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a mighty hand, with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Remember who I am. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. What, what God is saying to Moses is, I made a covenant, a promise that will not fail to your ancestors. And it takes some time to work it through. But you are part of the great story of redemption that I am working in this world. And it doesn't end here. You're just at the beginning, Moses. Don't abandon so quickly. In fact, this is going to be a bit of a challenge. There's going to be a battle before all things come to be settled, before there is ever peace in the land. Go back. But remember, I'm the one who is faithful to see it through. That reminder is good for us because sometimes we feel like God is at work in something and if we struggle or if we falter along the way, or maybe it's just that it doesn't happen in our timing, right? Like we've prayed for something and it's been a week or a month or a year and come on, God, I thought you were going to help me in this. God's timing is different than our timing, but his promises never, ever, ever fail. It's not only true in this story, but it's true in the pages of scripture again and again and again. God's promises are for his people's good. If you haven't seen it fulfilled yet, if it hasn't all come together, if you haven't seen the work of God bringing reconciliation to your life, well, hold on, my friends, because it's still coming. So they go back. They go back to Pharaoh. And God is telling Moses specifically he's going to use Moses like a god. He's going to come before and challenge Pharaoh from a position of sort of divine authority. And that, and that um, Aaron is going to be like your prophet. So in the way that God would speak through prophets, they would work together, a human mouthpiece for the word of God. He's saying, I'm sending you all together kind of like that. Moses, I'm going to speak to you. You're going to speak to Aaron. And then Aaron is going to bring those words before Pharaoh. So go back, speak all the things that I've told you. And um, Pharaoh is going to let the Israelites out of the land. But first, it's going to take a little bit of time. Now, at least he has a warning. Like, it might not happen right away because I will harden Pharaoh's heart and I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. What happens with these plagues is that Pharaoh kind of thinks about it maybe for a second and then his heart is hardened. And at first we find that Pharaoh himself just says, mm, I'm calloused, I'm hard-hearted, I'm stubborn, I'm, uh, I think that I'm great, I'm not doing this. He hardens his own heart. But then somewhere in the midst of it, God is like, well, I see what Pharaoh does. And so actually God hardens Pharaoh's heart. God like tunes uh, uh, Pharaoh, uh, um, causes Pharaoh to tune God out so that his power might be multiplied. And we see that in the plagues that come. Kind of like, couldn't one time get this done? You know, there's 10 plagues. We're going to dive into some of those plagues next week. Um, but, but so this, God's going to be at work in the midst of all this. He sends Moses and Aaron back to Pharaoh again. 
And this time, they're supposed to do a sign because Pharaoh is going to ask them, okay, you're back to ask this again. Well, um, I am all-powerful. I am divine. I'm God, whatever. You're coming on behalf of some other God. Well, then show me. Prove it to me. Pharaoh asks them to perform a wonder. And what they're supposed to do is to take that staff, that shepherd's staff, that stick, and throw it on the ground, and it will become a snake. God prepared Moses for this before. They've already been through this one time. He knows that it can happen. So he says, do this before Pharaoh, and it's going to become a great serpent. And so they do. They go before Pharaoh and does as the Lord commanded them. Aaron throws down this staff before Pharaoh and the officials. It becomes a snake, a, a great serpent even. And Pharaoh then is like, ah. Oh, I get this, it's a showdown. And he's like, you wanna, you wanna go to battle with me? Let's do it. And so he calls in his magicians and his sorcerers. And he's like, that's a cool wonder, but guess what, we can do the same. And he says, uh, come on, magicians. And then they take sticks and they throw them on the ground and they become snakes. Well, then the stick that Moses and Aaron had thrown on the ground, um, it goes and it swallows up the other snakes. It eats them, it swallows them. And again, if you are Pharaoh and you have a snake on your head, and the snake is the sign of your rule and your reign and your divine authority and your power, the snake says that I am the mightiest in the land, and somebody comes on behalf of Yahweh and throws a stick on the ground and it becomes a snake and it eats your snakes, you better be on watch. <laughs> you better pay attention. But Pharaoh hardens his heart and he doesn't let him go. So this is kind of the first round of things where, where now he's saying, oh, something's going on here, and maybe he's paying attention, but he's still, he's sending them out. Now, the labor's too good, the city building is too awesome, too important to me, I'm holding on to my power with everything I've got, I'm not interested. And so God then sends Moses to come speak to Pharaoh the next day, and he meets him beside uh, the water. They go beside a river bank a place where the Nile runs or the canals. The Nile would have been um, built into lots of canals where the water would flow through the area and sustain them because they're in the middle of the desert and water is really, really important. He goes to that riverbank and he takes that same staff that had turned into the snake that ate the other snakes and he touches the Nile and the Nile turns from water into blood flowing through. Now their source of livelihood the water that they drink, the water that feeds their livestock, the water that helps them cook in their kitchens, the water that is a part of them sustaining life is not drinkable, is not usable, and in fact, it is blood. Well, Pharaoh, again, notices, but not quite yet convinced. <laughs> Once again, M Moses says to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they could go worship me in the wilderness. You haven't listened yet. But a couple of days go by and the Nile turns back into regular water. We don't know what was happening in Pharaoh's head, if he was thinking about it or if he's wondering or if he's questioning, but in the end, the water comes back and so he's not bothered again. And he says, no, keep working, keep building. And then this is considered the first plague. Happens nine more times, increasing in sort of extremeness. And again and again, God is using the things that the people of Egypt depend upon for life and for livelihood. And he's showing his power by demonstrating his ability to utterly uproot the ways of their world. And eventually, Pharaoh's gonna let the people go. There's quite a showdown along the way. There's quite a battle back and forth. And there's a challenge for Pharaoh because he's hardened his heart and he's not interested and he's cut off from even the possibility of this God, Yahweh, doing something or having some sort of power. And sometimes we find that's kind of like us too. We're comfortable in the situation that we live in. We're happy with the things that we have. We're content. In, in the way that our world works, and it is easier to harden our heart and tune out the voice of God that causes us to be uncomfortable or that convicts us of something. It's easier to protect ourselves and our resources, and if we have it, power and authority, to turn our eyes against the suffering 
of our neighbors to tune out the cries of people in our community who are hurting and suffering, especially if we had something to do with causing it or enabling it. Better to harden your heart and keep doing the things you've always been doing. Sometimes we're like Pharaoh. Sometimes we're like Moses. Sometimes we have an opportunity to speak up, to challenge authority, to step in on behalf of others, and it is terrifying, and it causes risk of our reputation, and it is embarrassing or uncomfortable or vulnerable, and, but it is unshakable. God has called us to say something, to advocate, to care, to notice the people who are suffering in our midst. And sometimes it really makes a huge difference. Sometimes it comes up in everyday, ordinary life, and sometimes it, it comes up in huge ways. Maybe not exactly like Moses, but there are stories where God has called people to do amazing, courageous things on behalf of others. I want to share with you a story that I uh, was reading because of our connection through Compassion International. We have a um, sponsored child that lives in Brazil, and this is a story of a child that lives in Togo, a country in West Africa. This girl's name is Aklo Blessy. There's a picture of her for you um, that you can s maybe it'll come up in a minute. Aqua Blessy is a girl that um, is that lives in Togo. She when she was four years old she lived in the midst of a community where voodoo was strongly present where um, where people were engaged in dark arts and blood sacrifices and eating raw meat and all sorts of other things in, in order to do um, kind of magical things for their community. Her mom, in fact, was a servant there at the temple in their community and invo was involved in supporting the shrine. Uh, when Akla Blessy was born, her parents wanted so much the favor, there, there she is, her parents so much wanted the favor of whatever powers and, and, and darkness and such that was a part of this, that they actually went into the shrine to give birth to their daughter. Well, this child then was set apart in the eyes of the community as someone who then may rise up to be a great leader within sort of the voodoo community there. Some things had happened in their family, and her father noticed that the children were suffering and struggling and that they didn't have enough food to eat. And he noticed that there were kids in their community that were getting extra support and resources from a Christian ministry center that had been established in partnership with Compassion International. That there were kids that were able to go to school and that were getting some meals and even health care and shoes and things that they needed to have a good and vibrant life. And he said, well, my kids are suffering and in fact, maybe this voodoo stuff isn't actually working for us. Maybe I can take them to that Christian ministry center and get them the support and help they need. And in fact, they did. Well, Alco Blessing, Aklo Blessy, um, was involved then in that ministry center, but somebody in the midst of the voodoo community then saw that this little girl was going and be a, a part of this Jesus community and getting resources here in this other place. And so they decided that that just was a threat to their power and a concern. And so they went and they kidnapped her from her home. They took her from her parents' home and they brought her to live there and to serve in the shrine, to lead her in, in, in the ways that would be... Um, basically to pave the way for her to one day be a great priestess of voodoo in their community. Her father was deeply disturbed. Her mom was still involved in the life of this whole thing. And, and, and her dad, though, thought, this is not okay. And something has got to change. This is going to, this is going to kill my daughter. This is going to ruin her life. And so he went to the Christians that were there, a part of that Compassion Ministry Center, and he said, can you do anything? Can you help me? They've taken her, and, and, and we have to get her back. And so the thing that the leaders there did is they started to pray, and they called upon 15 other churches in their area and Christian ministry centers, and they said, the first thing we have to do, this is a spiritual battle, we have to pray that God would go before us, that the Lord Almighty would be at work, that God would bring her freedom about and so they fasted and they prayed for weeks and for weeks and for weeks. And don't you know her father waited anxiously 
hoping that something would happen, that something would change, that one day he would wake up and everything would be different, and months went by. But her birthday was coming up, and when she was turning five years old, the ministry leaders had the idea that perhaps they could take gifts to her at the shrine. Part of the worship within the culture was is that you would bring gifts and offerings to the shrine and, and bring it to the priestesses and they would offer them in sacrifices and things like that and so that maybe if they brought gifts to the little girl who was living there, um, maybe at least they could have some interaction with her, with her and maybe somehow God would use that. Well, he did. Something happened on the day that they all went to go see her and visit her. And the woman who was uh, over all of the ministry there in that place and the one who had, in fact, taken her out of her home, her heart was so moved. Something happened where there was a, a, a break in the hardness of her heart. And she saw this girl interacting with her father in a community that loved her. And they let them buy her out of her servitude to the voodoo community. The courage of this girl's father, the faithfulness of a family who prayed and listened to God and sought ways to intercede and creative opportunities to re-engage with this little girl's life led her to a life of freedom, one which uh, is going to be a very different path than her mother would live into. I know we don't often have an opportunity to step up to something quite like that. But there are people who are taken into slavery of all kinds in our world here and now, today. Sometimes literal. Sometimes it's by just really poor working conditions, a really heartbreaking family situations, or violence that is done. And if we see it, there are times that God will say, hey, it's you to, that needs to step in. I'm going to use your voice. I'm going to use your courage, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to go before you, but I'm going to use your story and your life to bring freedom to someone else. It's okay to be reluctant. Moses surely was. But it's also good to be faithful because it is through the yeses and the trusting of God's promises that God uses people to change the world. We'll look at what happens with Pharaoh over the next couple of weeks. He is not so ready to be used by God or not so interested in the movement of God. In fact, his heart grows harder and harder. And yet I am reminded of the words of the prophet Ezekiel that says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. God can do all kinds of transforming, uh, life-renewing things. He can do it with you, and he can do it with me. He can change this world by us hearing his voice and saying yes. We can be like Moses. We certainly ought not be like Pharaoh. Would you join me in being people who listen, who pay attention, who don't give up when things don't come together the first time? to be people who courageously go in the name of the Lord Almighty and participate in what he's doing in this world. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we are grateful for the call that you have on our lives, um, for the ways that you convict us and use us. We confess that many times it's easier to be like Pharaoh and comfortable and content with the circumstances that we live with, even if they aren't all quite right. Instead, may we be people who are willing to pay attention to your call, to your power, to your actions. If we have authority and we have power, may we be people that use it for good. If we are convicted, if we see someone hurting and suffering or struggling alone, may we be people who run in and help or act on their behalf. We can say yes to this kind of stuff, God, because we trust that you're going before us. But you really are the God who is the great I am, the one who holds all being in your hands, the one who is always, always, always faithful 
to every promise you have made. May we see it. May we live like it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing our final song. worshiping with us today. As you leave this place, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we would love to extend a welcome to you. Um, we have a welcome center out the doors to the left and would love to give you a visitor gift, a little bag to say thanks for being with us. Receive this blessing and benediction as we go. Lord, send us in to the rest of this day to seek uh, your face, to do your will, to hear your voice, and to have courage for you are with us. Send us forth into a world where we realize you answer all of your promises. You bring all things together for your good and that you go before us. It gives us joy. Send us in the power of the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit today and always. Amen.